Hey everybody, this is Mike. Uh, before we get today's episode started, I have a bit of a uh, um, disclaimer, I guess. Uh, we recorded this episode on Sunday night. Then on Monday morning, there was a press release from Paramount Pictures announcing the next Star Trek movie, Star Trek Fourteen, And uh, a lot of what we recorded on Sunday night was basically invalidated. However, instead of throwing things out, we will let you hear our thoughts because there's a lot of stuff in there which is worthy of your listening to. However, the big thing was we speculate on who the writers of this new movie, Star Trek 14 or whatever you want to call it, are. And One of the things that they announced in the press release is that the writers are Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne. Now, Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne uh, have never had anything produced yet, but they have written a lot of stuff, including the original script for Star Trek XIII that Roberto Orsi was planning on directing before they decided to go in another direction and hire Justin Lin uh, and and have a script uh, completely rewritten from scratch by Simon Pegg and Doug Jung. So now J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay are getting another shot at Star Trek, and uh, we are very, very happy about that. And one of the reasons why we're very happy about that is because we had a chance to speak to them back when they were working on Star Trek Thirteen, and hear what they had to say about Star Trek and, and movies and all the rest of it. And uh, if you want to listen to that conversation, check out Commentary Trek Stars 87, which is titled Yes And. And uh, yeah, very, very interesting uh, conversation with the two of them. So check it out. And here is our show, which is completely outdated now for your entertainment. Uh, We hope you enjoy our speculation, which is completely off the mark as per usual. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about this a lot more next week. On with the show. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry, and you're listening to Trek FM. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Stage 9, Trek FM show about the people who make Star Trek. I'm Mike. I'm John. And today we're going to be talking about Star Trek movie directors, namely our favorites. But before we get into that, let's talk about a little bit of news, shall we? And there is an interesting tidbit of news, isn't there, Mike? Yeah, okay, so this episode is getting released on July 22nd, 2016, which is the day that Star Trek Beyond comes out, right? You are you are all warping into the future once again Yeah, when this episode drops. We're not talking about Star Trek Beyond today, and we apologize for that, but we, we need a chance to see it first. I, we apologize, production schedules yep. being as they are. I know that everyone who's listening to this has already seen Star Trek Beyond, or most people have. And we'll be talking about Star Trek Beyond next week. But yes. this week, let's talk about the next Star Trek movie. Because, you know, we can't just, uh, we can't just enjoy anything. We, <laughs> <laughs> this you, is, you have, yeah, you're thinking about dessert while you're eating dinner, it's, right? It's, just admit it. It's that comic book mentality where, you know, like every... Yeah. You know, issue ends on a cliffhanger, and you're like, I mean, I always said the most, the best book of of the month every month at the comic book store was previews, the previews catalog, where you could see what was coming out next month, and you're like, that's going to be amazing, and then you read it, and you're like, that's it, what's coming out next month? Oh, that's going to be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, uh, at the press conference for Star Trek Beyond, of course people were asking about whether or not there would be a fourth film in the Kelvin timeline. And after sort of dancing around the issue slightly, the answer was basically yes. It was kind of like one of these, like, 
uh, well, we can't really say anything, but yes, you know? Yes. But, and it's like, okay, well, that's cool, and that's, you know, uh, sort of obvious and everything like that, but then Scott Mance uh, posted a thing both on Twitter and Facebook. Scott Mance is, he's, he is a, uh, a journalist and, and a film critic and movie reporter for uh, Access Hollywood, I believe. Yeah. But in his prior life, he was an employee of Creation Entertainment, and he would work at like conventions and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he is probably a bigger Star Trek fan than you, me, or anyone else listening to this show. So, yes, he's actually a lot of fun to uh, to to see him talk about, like when you see him on screen and he's talking about Star Trek that his enthusiasm for it is palpable and, and it's pretty great. And it's funny because, you know, he's obviously developed a good relationship with, you know, the cast and crew of the new movies and everything. And, you know, there you see like the times where he's interviewing them on set or whatever, or apparently at this press conference and stuff. And they're all basically, just making fun of him for being a huge nerd because this is where he gets to put on his nerd hat, you know? Yeah. And they're just like, man, Scott, Scott, you're, you're so Scott. So, (laughs) (laughs) so he interviewed JJ Abrams at the press junket and he put this up on, I think it was Schmoville's uh, Facebook page. He said, Hey, Schmoville, I have breaking news. J.J. Abrams just confirmed to me that a fourth Star Trek reboot film has already been written, and it will bring together Chris Pine and Chris Hemsworth. It's really happening. Now, okay, Mm -hmm. of all the people who you would expect to be cast in Star Trek IV, Mm -hmm. teen, whatever you want to call it, Chris Hemsworth would probably be kind of towards the bottom of this list yeah i wouldn't expect him to make a comeback hearing his name i would immediately see i I think people are thinking probably time travel and they meet up sort of thing i i skew personally toward the godfather part two mindset you know we'll see you know some intercutting of like you know his life and our kirk's life and but most likely it's just going to be time travel and they meet up yeah, you know, I've heard a number of th- theories, you know, it's like time travel is certainly a possibility. There could be some sort of alternate reality thing, of course. The Godfather 2 thing is is an interesting idea for sure. Although the one thing that I would kind of maybe think wouldn't it would steer me away from that theory is that uh it says it, it really makes it sound like they would be together. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I don't know, because like they'd be sharing scenes together. I don't know. I don't know. I but maybe when he crashed into the Narada, there was some red matter that transported him through time or something. Hey, you know that that wouldn't be because I mean that's the thing is like you know you first you think like how are they gonna do that you know, and then you start thinking through the history of Star Trek and you're like well, there have only been about you know. 347 instances where this has happened, you know? Yeah. I mean, it would be really simple for them. I mean, people have said, you know, the Guardian of Forever, which sure. I think would be perfect because, for one thing, okay, we've never gone back to that idea, and, and, you know, it is as classic as classic can be, and I think using that to tell a different story would be really interesting. You know, oh, I'm sorry. I need to say for Aaron that we did go back for it for for the animated series. I apologize. But uh, aside from from yesteryear, we've never gone back to the Guardian of Forever. Um, but you know that would also tie in, I think, to to what what I believe the title for the next movie should be. I, I think it was Philip Gilfus on on Earl Grey who first came up with this idea. But you know, you need to name the next movie Star Trek. Mm-hmm forever right yeah and guardian of forever that's exactly perfect. right You're right that, we, that works out perfectly i mean i mean I'm, I'm a fan of this sort of edward style of like you know creating the name and the poster first and then building a story around it and perhaps they did that and darling globus did it to great success yeah yeah hey you know why not 
there's any millions of things that could be happening, but I think it's it's really interesting creatively, and I think it's also really interesting, you know, from a business standpoint, because Chris Hemsworth was a nobody in, you know, 2009, and now he's Thor. He's the god of thunder, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's that's exciting. It's exciting. If they throw in Chris Pratt, I mean, if they have Chris Hemsworth play, you know, uh, Papa Kirk traveling through time somehow, or or they use the Guardian Forever or anything, then you work in Chris Pratt as his brother, and then you have Chris Chris Pine playing, you know, Jim Kirk. I mean, come on, yeah. that's sort of a that's sort of a movie dream come true. I think all three Chris's working together. Yeah, Chris it's unstoppable. Cubed. Chris cubed. Yeah. yeah. Who's the guy who plays Captain America? What's his name? Oh, Chris Evans. Yeah, right. you need he would to get be a Chris cameo Evans though. in there too. Yeah, no, but he'd be like a cameo or something. Like, you know, the guy working the slusho booth. Yeah. And like it spills on him when uh when Sam and Jim get in a fight and George has to break it up. That there you go. I I, I think I think that, that that's a solid idea. Get get all four of them together, you know? <laughs> I mean they could play like all the Kirks, you know, like Chris Evans could play like Kirk's son or something like that. And Oh, uh, if it's Guardian of Forever, you have Jim Kirk's son, you have David. Yeah, and he and he comes from the future, right? And they, 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 they go. It writes itself, really. Yep, yep. Yeah, but but the other interesting <laughs> thing about this, I mean, as interesting as it is that Chris Hemsworth is going to be in it, and oh my god, my wife is so happy that Thor is going to be in this new movie. I can't tell you. <laughs> um, the, the the more interesting thing to me is that he says the script has already been written. I mean, they're really getting a jump on things here. You know, and and who knows what that means. I mean, that could be, I think, a number of things. One, it could be them saying, like, okay, they're about to show us the door. We need to be ready, you know, with something something big. I'm talking about, like, Bad Robot, right? Because who knows what's involved with that contract and how many, you know, movies they're signed up for and everything like that. And it could be that they're just like, don't take this away from us. We want our, you know, Kelvin timeline. But it, it could also mean that they just came up with this extremely good idea and are like, you know, we need to write this now because why wait? You know, it's exciting. Yeah, I mean, it would, but, and it could also potentially speak to the whole thing where everybody had the meltdown about the reshoots and everything. Maybe they did write this script and they said, we need to put in something that's going to tie in with it so that when we come back to it, it doesn't feel forced. That could be, that could be. Or, or it could just be because, you know, they were under such pressure to get this done. They were like, let's not do this again. You know, this is great and everything, but we made this movie in like a, a couple days. But, you know, let's let's try to write this one well in advance so that we're not under the gun, you know, every step of the way. So, or, or it could be smoke and mirrors. It could this be that too. not be the first time that J.J. J. Abrams has dealt the truth a less than honest blow in the press or it also might not it might be a misquote or you know or a misunderstanding of what he's saying too uh, no i i tend to fall on the uh verify anything abrams says with two other sources first category <laughs> okay okay well my, my big question is if the script is written who wrote it i definitely think it's jung and peg I mean, because uh, the the script for uh, Man of Steel came out of uh, writer's block sessions for Dark Knight Rises. Maybe this came out of writer's block sessions for Star Trek Beyond. That could be. That could be. I don't know. I mean, does Simon Pegg have time? I I could see Jung for sure. Would Simon Pegg? I mean, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I I could definitely see that happening. I, I was wondering if maybe since, you know, the rumors were that the Payne, McKay, and Orsi script involved you know, Kirk meeting his future self played by, yeah. you know, William Shatner, if maybe they were going back to that idea in some way. Possible. Sure. At most, we've got a treatment and Abram says, well, you know, I mean, we know where the script is going to go, but, you know, it's really like two pager. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that could be a possible scenario, but who knows? Who knows? It's exciting. Nonetheless, you know, Star Trek is not sure. going away. And that's that's pretty great. No, I, I, I agree with you, though, that, um, you know, this would be a very good play for Bad Robot to say we're ready for the next one. We have full confidence in this one and we've already got 
uh, you know, our two major leads signed up you yeah. know, and sewn up for this. Yeah. So, yeah. And Hemsworth. So, so that's cool. That's cool. But I will tell you that the reason I think that the, the finished script thing is not necessarily true is because they've also said that uh, they are not going to recast Chekhov. Yeah. And so that I doubt that they wrote any script where, you know, they didn't have Chekhov in it. That's true. And they did say, like, they've asked him, like, how are you going to deal with that? And he's like, we're figuring that out. I, I, yeah. I, I, I know some people have said, you know, like, well, just say that he was transferred to the Reliant, you know? And I mean, there, there's something that poetic about that, you know, would, and, and that would be a way to go. I, I kind of, you know, Nolan talked about this when, Christopher Nolan, sorry, talked about this when uh, they were making Dark Knight Rises and, you know, obviously Heath Ledger died in between Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises. And they're like, well, what are you going to do? You know, how are you going to explain it? And he's like, we're not we're not going to mention the character because I feel that to give a fictional explanation for a real person's death is to you know cheapen that and and it's not you know it's not exactly respectful to you know the reality you know to to this person so we we made a conscious effort to just not say anything about it you know not mention it at all and i i think that i mean there's there's that makes sense to me i think that you know in a lot of ways that might be just the thing to do and i mean that's a very original series thing to do i mean there's episodes where Chekhov isn't there and it's just like whatever he's gone you know yeah i think that yes that's how i would do it personally but i agree yeah yeah all right well can't can't wait can't wait for star trek Forever. Um. <laughs> well, first we have to move beyond this one. That's true. To get there. That's true. That's true. All right. Well, in the meantime, now everyone is celebrating the release of of Star Trek Beyond. I imagine that uh, most of the the listeners on Trek FM. I, I if I if I can imagine like Trek FM's you know listenership as like a a a real place you know like some some like tangible mm-hmm. physical place i imagine it is something like coruscant at the end of the jedi special edition <laughs> uh i would prefer to think of them as something like well first and foremost which special edition but i i would cast it more as naboo or uh tatooine because i would certainly hope they're not doing any violence to uh and anybody well they're not they're not being violent they're just tearing down statues no and on coruscant very clearly you see a a stormtrooper unless he was crowd surfing in celebration (laughs) he's sort of being torn apart by the crowd just a minor note okay yeah that's true i say i never watched the jedi special edition i have to say i'm heathen philistine but anyway i'm just you know respectful of artists and their work you know i think i don't think that they should be changed after they're dead but whatever that's a conversation for another podcast Oh, that that is a whole other conversation for a whole other podcast, my friend. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes. So regardless of that, all that's going on. People are, you know, dancing in the streets over Star Trek Beyond and how awesome it is, apparently. I haven't seen it yet, but, you know, whatever. Um, well, I guess we'll find out in a couple of days. We will. But uh, let's talk about some directors of movies because one of the big things leading up to beyond is of course the fact that there is a new star trek director and it's justin lynn and he has a a very uh um well-regarded career as a filmmaker one which we we looked at in depth on commentary trek stars go check it out and you know maybe it's time to to go back and look at the other people who were uh in that chair throughout the franchise's history. So yeah. so today we are going to look at our three favorites. We're going to get we're going to list off our three favorite directors from the movies um based on their work in the franchise, but we'll discuss, you know, their work outside of the franchise as well. Yeah. Of course, us being us, of course we will. Yeah. 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 
So uh, we'll just start at number three and work our way down to number one. And yeah, let's do it. Number three. What's your number three, John? Number three, best director. I mean, I guess should we list off who the directors are just so that people know? Well, yeah, uh, the directors are uh, in order. Robert Wise for the motion picture, Nicholas Meyer for Star Trek II, Leonard Nimoy for Star Trek III and IV, uh, William Shatner for Star Trek V. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas Meyer comes back for Star Trek VI. David Carson steps in for Star Trek Generations. Jonathan Frakes helms First Contact and Insurrection. Stuart Baird, the uh, fan favorite, uh, Star Trek Nemesis is, is his baby. And then, of course, J.J. Abrams revives the franchise for the big screen with Star Trek, in parentheses, 2009, and Star Trek Into Darkness. So that's eight directors, if I count right. Yeah, eight is enough. All right. So who's your number three? Uh, My number three may surprise you, but it would actually be David Carson. Because for whatever flaws there are with Generations, the reason I give it to him is because... I'm sorry, frankly, Insurrection is what knocks Frakes out of the running for it. Um, I feel that if Insurrection were at least as good as First Contact, I probably would have given him the number three spot. I think that Carson did a very good job with a very middling script at points. He had conditions placed on him. And I think that the movie, uh, in many regards, is beautiful. I think that it's well-paced. I think that it actually holds up better than I because, you know, we've all done the rewatch, you know, this year going through the movies. I think Generations held up better than I expected it to and actually spoke to me on a different level now that I'm older, which is, I think, another mark of a good work. Uh, So that's why Carson gets number three. You know, I uh, love Generations more than almost any other movie, if we're speaking cosmically. I think that it's it's a. A very, very, very good movie and way better than most people give it credit for. It's also the movie which, you know, sort of made me fall in love with the big screen. The first movie I went to the sneak preview of on Thursday night, you know, before it came out and all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I I love Generations. However, I, I do think that Carson's direction compared to, you know, some of the other filmmakers really does feel kind of small at times. I feel like he definitely, you can tell that he comes from the small screen. And Mm -hmm. while he is, uh, you know, a very good director, I mean, he directed Emissary, the pilot for Deep Space Nine, and he directed Yesterday's Enterprise and and all these things. Um, I think maybe he just didn't quite grasp the scope that other filmmakers who who would Mm. come after him did and i feel like he maybe being Mm. so familiar with the way the the production worked sort of adopted a more television type of style because of that interesting yeah very very interesting point of view don't agree with it obviously but very interesting i do think like you know the the photography the lighting and everything is is really good you know they got john alonzo the guy who shot chinatown to to shoot that movie and you know there is definitely some pretty interesting stuff in there i mean it was certainly noticeable like when i went to see it you know as a 14 year old not knowing how movies worked i was like why is the bridge so dark what happened why did they turn off all the lights (laughs) i don't understand but but now i i appreciate that more um also of note um I think the first, the very first non-Star Trek thing that Brian Fuller wrote was a television movie version of Carrie. Really? Yes. Which is supposed to be not good, but it's supposed to be very yeah. true to the book. And that television movie was directed by David Carson. No kidding. Yeah, we'll have if to it watch all it. C- all comes, yeah, oh, we'll, we do, Joel. We'll have to track it down. Okay. Yeah, that 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 works for me. All right. So who's going to be your number three? My number three is Jonathan Frakes. <laughs> Not surprising. Not surprising. Um, I see. I totally see what you're saying about insurrection. Right. But mm-hmm. I, I mean, I can't not look at first contact and be impressed. I mean, like all of the things that I just said about generations feeling small. I feel like those problems were fixed by Jonathan Frakes. I think that he really did 
um, adopt a, a much slicker, cool, big scale for that movie. Now, see, what's what's really interesting here is I would flip it right back around and pretty much everything you said about Carson's, the, the feel being too limited, about it feeling like a TV production in a lot of ways. When I recently rewatched First Contact and reordered my list of of Star Trek movies, my rankings of them, uh, very specifically First Contact, the comment I made about it was it felt like a TV movie to me. Interesting. It, it felt that like the the wacky camera motion and distortions of looking through the Borg's eyes was something that got a bit under my skin. And I was like, this is a TV thing. Come on. Um, you know, it's like, ooh, spooky view. Uh, there were now that doesn't take away from their, their, you know, first contact is an enjoyable movie. I'm not saying that it isn't, but there were a lot of there were a lot of things that made it feel more like a TV production to me. I felt it looked like a TV production, like when they're on the hull and they're walking around. That looked like a TV sequence to me. That 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 scene maybe doesn't work too well. You know that that scene is <laughs> is funny because simulate this right yeah you know the the thing that <laughs> and cut to commercial there there's this scene where on that that in that scene where uh, they like shoot something and I think he he shoots something on the ship and like the gas shoots yes. out to to like shoot the Borg yeah. into space and I always thought that that was the coolest thing ever and I remember sitting there watching it with Max at one point and he's like. I hate this so much. I hate it. And I'm like, why? And he's like, why is the gas falling back down to the hull? That's like, it's, you know, gravity. No, there is no gravity. It should be just shooting out into space. That's the worst effect ever. And I'm like, Max, you're the only person who would ever notice that. Cut them some slack. And he's like, I can't, I can't. And then like years later, I I got the, the DVD, right? And I'm mm-hmm. listening to the commentary with Ron Moore and Brandon Braga. And I think it was Ron Moore who's like, I hate this effect so much. Why is this stuff falling back down? What's with this gravity? And I'm like, there okay, all right, fine, Max, you win. <laughs> no, although, uh, I don't know. You, you, I suppose you could say the ship is traveling and so it's casual. Anyway, uh, the heavier particles, it's running into them. I don't Whatever. know. If, if, if it's separating the Borg it sends that off into space, it sends the yes. mass of the Borg into space, you'd figure the... Anyway, regardless yeah. of that, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think that, you know, like the wacky camera movements and stuff, it's so not what we were used to seeing on Next Generation on like a weekly basis that I think seeing that was really cool and you know I, I think i was responding to that but also like doing the rewatch now and seeing a lot of like jonathan frakes's episodes of the series like as it was you know sort of airing um you can really see him s- sort of developing this style and his episodes are much more visually striking than your average episodes of next generation and aside from the fact that he was a member of the cast and you know intimately tied into all of this stuff I can see, like, even if he wasn't a cast member, I can totally see why they gave him the job for first contact because, you know, if you're keeping it in house uh, yeah. like they do. You know. I, again, I'm not, I'm not knocking first contact's enjoyability, right? It, it's not my favorite next gen movie, which makes me, I, I, you and I, I guess, intersect on that point then. Yeah. I mean, and, generations, you know. I, I, like, I, I think that first contact is the best of the next gen movies, but Mm. generations holds a special place in my heart where logic does not apply. You know what I mean? Fair, fair comment. Okay. But there are a Uh, lot of people who don't like first contact because the, like if you start dissecting the plot, it really doesn't make any sense at all. Well, yeah, I, I'm not talking about dissecting the plot there. There were different choices made, but again, if I'm going to give, generations enough of a past to say that it was a good director making a good movie with a mediocre script i'm not gonna hammer frakes for you know like obviously there are franchise limitations put on anybody especially at this point like they're 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 for lack of a better word they're desperate to have star trek stay like they need to prove that it can survive without the original cast at that point um and you know and i know that it's kind of hipster chic to beat up on insurrection but i haven't liked that movie from the moment from the word go i walked out of the theater i was like ugh 
and my esteem of it drops every single time I try to rewatch it. So I I like it, but I definitely do think it is the worst Star Trek movie. Mm. Although, well, <laughs> we yeah, mm, you know. Okay. Uh, right. So who who. <laughs> Uh, I suppose that vaults us up into uh, who has the number two spot. Yeah. Who has the number Which, two uh, sh- spot for you? For me, that's going to go to Nimoy because Star Trek three, uh, as much as I've turned around a bit on it, I used to really beat up on three. And as part of this rewatch, I again found that it, it was actually better than I've given it credit for over the years. Although the ending still still really drags and uh, like it's what star trek 3 basically is what keeps nimoy in the second spot like all things being equal for me two and six are just untouchable in in terms of being star trek movies they just are in every regard they're just untouchable four puts nimoy in the conversation to jockey with meyer because four is truly and i like On the rewatch, I I really rediscovered this. It really is a remarkable film in that these are, and, you know, I believe you said this before on the show, like, if this is the first Star Trek movie you show somebody, even though it's in 1986 San Francisco, these are still the characters. They still get who these people are. It still makes sense. And if they watch another Star Trek movie, it's not going to be jarring in any way. Like, the the characters hold up. Uh, But... So three, though, the ending is what like, there were there were choices made by him as a director for how to cut together and the flow of that ending uh, that, you know, from the final battle all the way to the rejoining of the Katra, where it just you can tell that it is somebody still working through finding their definite style. And I think that's what holds it back. And that's what keeps him in number two. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that he is a very good director, um, mm-hmm. but he doesn't he doesn't crack the the top three for me. I mean, I think that his his strength is working with the actors for sure. You know, he gets I think some of the best performances out of people uh, in his movies, but um, I think maybe visually he's not quite as inventive as some of the other directors. So that kind of pushes him down for me. Okay. Right. So who who's in your number two slot? My number two is Nicholas Meyer, which I believe is your number one, correct? He is my number one. Okay. Abs- he's my, as Jack Palance might say, he's my number one and guy. <laughs> yes, Jack Palance would say that. <laughs> yes. Um, so so wh- why is he your number one guy? Because he produced two movies that, Regardless of anything else that he's done, Star Trek's two and six are, I mean, nigh flawless. Especially the director's edition of two, like the the director's edition of two is what permanently vaults it back above six. Like six and two fluctuated. I went back and forth between the two of them constantly through the years, but the director's edition of two, just because of the different sick bay scene with Scotty like vaults it over and having an extra scene of understanding why Peter Preston matters. But what's amazing about both of them is with Star Trek six, I still get the warm and fuzzies at the end. Like you feel like this is, you know, the prize fighters with one last great fight in them. And you feel this great sense of scale and adventure and uh, satisfaction at the end. And with two, no matter how many times I watch it, I still get choked up at the end. And that's just because it's constructed so brilliantly. It transcends its genre. And like it, even if it wasn't the crew of the Enterprise, if you took this, this plot and you, you transported it to some other space crew or adjusted it to be a ship in the 1800s, the movie still is incredible. So that's, that's, where I, that's why he's my number one. Why is, he, why is he number two and not number one for you? Well, uh, he's number two for me because uh, I think that in addition to being a very good director, he's also the best writer of any of the Star Trek movies. You know, his his two movies, two and six, are the best written movies, not necessarily in that order. And, uh, you know, I just rewatched 
uh, m- most of the original series movies and looking at number six in particular i mean that movie is nearly flawless like you're saying um and i think that visually it's, it's very interesting but the tone which he captures i think is very very solid you know and it's something which is n- has not really ever been seen on star trek before or since uh, at least up until deep space nine i think um but it, that it just sort of that mastery of tone from the very first shot i mean the 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 overture music that they play over the credits is just really sets the tone and then you start off a movie with an explosion i mean that's so great and then you're just into it and the lighting and everything is is some of the best in any of the movies by far and i think the story is the best in any of the movies by far you know he gets great performances out of these people but it's it's really the tone more than anything which i think is you know sort of a product of you know the editing you know and and everything else as well but i'm, I'm very very impressed by the editing in those movies and it's like the whole package really you know everything together um to make you know some of the best movies ever made uh that's that's why i put nicholas meyer at number two so who's your number one my number one is jj abrams which i don't think is a shock to anyone of course it is of course it is because i mean the thing about it and you know whether or not these movies are better or worse than anything else that we've seen i mean the thing that they are are movies which bring the franchise into the 21st century. You know, this is, I mean, I've said this a million times before, but, you know, Star Trek always felt behind the times. You know, well, not in 1966, but from the Next Generation era, it always felt behind the times. Like, it was one step behind what was going on, you know? I mean, if you think about, like, shows which were contemporary with, say you know, Voyager, you know, you're looking at things like ER and, and, uh, the West wing. And it's like the style and everything that the filmmaking at play on television, on the best of television was definitely a step above what was going on on Star Trek. You know, they tried to catch up with things like 24 and stuff like that when they were doing Enterprise, and they just couldn't get there. They were just always just one step behind. And I think Star Trek 2009 is what catapulted Star Trek, the franchise, into the... I'm not going to say mainstream, but into the the modern day when it comes to filmmaking. And, okay. and uh, I think all the credit there, or a substantial amount of the credit there, goes to J.J. Abrams and the fact that he is such a great director. I mean, I've said this a million times before, but you know, everything that he does, all of the choices that he makes stylistically and everything are completely on the same wavelength with what I like to see, you know? I mean, it's his movies, the way he makes movies is the way that that I want to watch movies. I love the photography. I love the pacing. I love the humor. I love everything about that style. So to see, you know, my favorite science fiction franchise adopt that style, adopt the style of, you know, one of the best filmmakers in the world right now that's extremely exciting to me and i mean you know this is i guess another thing which you know just to to kind of break out of that i mean i said mission impossible 3 was the best movie of 2006 you know back before Mm -hmm. he even did star trek i think that star wars the force awakens was the best movie of last year and Mm -hmm. you know it's it's consistent it's consistent that that he is a great filmmaker whether he's doing star trek or not doing star trek it just it just works for me completely that's his he's no he he can't be topped at least he hasn't been Mm. topped yet Mm. so Mm. yes he's my number Mm. one Mm. i see the only thing that trips him up because as i was fond of saying that insurrection knocked freaks out and uh star trek 3 brought nimoy down a peg um into darkness 
I, I'm not even talking about the con thing, but the simple fact that essentially he made Star Trek 09 all over again and then meld like almost every one of his good instincts he worked against himself um, in terms of the the way that movie was put together uh, and the you know the the emotional disconnect at the end. But you know, I get what you're saying. I'm not one. I think that you know this about me by now. I'm not one to give credit points based on whether somebody brought the franchise forward or not. Yeah, so. no, and that's fine, and, and I can I can understand that. But I think that like he brought it. I mean, you know, I think that even Nicholas Meyer isn't like up to to a certain standard as far as direction is concerned. You know, I mean, mm. so that that's sort of like, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, hey man, it, We're, you know, it's different strokes. That's what makes the world go round, man. Yeah, I learned that from eighties TV. <laughs> All right, so to recap. You want to read off your, your top three just for the record? Yes, my top three. Uh, I will go in, in descending order. Uh, number three is David Carson for Star Trek Generations. Number two is Leonard Nimoy for Star Trek's three and four. And number one is Nicholas Meyer for Star Trek's two and six. And Mike, your list is? Number three is Jonathan Frakes for First Contact and Insurrection. Number two is Nicholas Meyer for... The Wrath of Khan and the Undiscovered Country. And number one is J.J. Abrams for Star Trek and Into Darkness. And there you go. Yeah. I'm excited to see where Justin Lin falls into this stuff, you know? I got high hopes, Mike. Me I too. really got high hopes that my, my list could be juggled here. Me too. Me too. It's going to be really exciting to see. And we will talk about that next week for sure. Yes, we will. All right. Well, it's been fun talking about Star Trek directors this week, but that's not all we're talking about on Trek FM. So here's a look at what you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. You know, Star Trek All Axios gives you a great acronym, though. STAR! STAR, yeah. Yes. (laughs) STAR! (laughs) Yeah, the upward (laughs) angle on the... Yeah, totally get it. To the journey! He tweets out, you know, like, hey, walking around with my mobile emitter, you know, hashtag blessed. You know, it's just, I'm sure that's what <laughs> oh, he's doing. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yep, yep. He's, uh, he's taking photos of his holographic non-dinner. Continuing mission. If you notice, my guest star in that one was Doug Drexler himself. Yes. One of, one of the great Star Trek minds, Doug Drexler, he kind of changed the lines a little bit to actually be what he thought would have been in a Starfleet inquest. Saturday Morning Trek. What I had to assure the fans when I talked at the convention or conventions was this is not going to be a kiddie show. This is not going to be a baby show. We are doing Star Trek. And we were able to do Star Trek in some ways a better way because we could have wonderful spaceships, we could have wonderful aliens, wonderful planets, and we still had good stories. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out these shows and find out what we're talking about in your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. It's all about beyond this week. Yes. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button. That helps us out greatly and makes it easier for other listeners to find the show as they search iTunes. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and of course you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website and grab the RSS link as well. We'd like to thank our associate producers, Jeff Sutter and Chris Steftenagel, for supporting Stage 9. Thank you. Yeah, guys, you're the best. You're you're like our, our, you're our real number ones and number twos. No, they're tied for number one. Okay. It's like golf. It just goes number one, number one, and then number three with them. (laughs) So who can be number three, and how do they become number three, Mike? Well, you go to uh, patreon.com slash trekfm and uh, help us out there. Um, 
you can uh, become a patron of the network on patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. You'll find our current goals and different milestone contribution levels along with all the great perks we have for you. These perks include early access to content, exclusive content, producer credits, seats on our content development team, and more. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. If you go to iTunes, leave us a review. You know, we want to hear what you have to say about our show. We want to know if uh, we're living up to your expectations or beyond your expectations, right? You see what I did there? We're going to ride that one as long as we can. (laughs) Forever. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, leave us a review and, hey, we'll read it on the air. If you want to contact us, you can uh, find the network on Twitter at Trek FM or on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trek FM. Or you can talk to us on the Babel Conference, which is our listener forum. Just head on over to Facebook and type the Babel Conference, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook or go to our website at trek.fm and click the discussion tab on the menu bar. John, where can people find you on the internet? Oh, you can find me being a scamp on Twitter at Kessel Junkie. Uh, you can find me over on Aggressive Negotiations, a Star Wars podcast on the Nerd Party Network with Trek FM's own Matt Rushing. And you can find me on Words with Nerds with my pal Craig. Where can they find you, Mike? Uh, you can find me right here on Trek FM producing s- From There to Here, which is uh, Trek FM's uh, daily rewatch of Star Trek from beginning to end for the 50th anniversary. And you can also find me on Twitter at Mumbles3K. All right. Well, that's it for Star Trek directors. That's it for shows that we're going to record prior to seeing Star Trek Beyond. We're beyond this world when we meet next, Mike, and we can uh, go beyond this topic and into the topic of Star Trek Beyond. Yes. So next week, we will definitely talk about Star Trek Beyond, and maybe we'll be able to talk about some news regarding the new series. It'll be interesting to see what we discover on Saturday. Mm-hmm.